hearing about the band is just how ordinary the band is and how, you know, un rock and roll in a lot of ways it is. How ordinary was your kind of growing up? Where, where are you from? Um, well, I'm from Southampton originally and grew up there and lived there for about 18 years and then went to university in London where we all met. So, in that respect, quite normal, ordinary. Yeah. What was your parents doing? Uh, archaeologists. But they were travelling all around the world and stuff, so we used, used to come to Ireland all the time because uh, like they used to teach in Galway at UCG. So, yeah, I sort of spent a lot of time milling around different countries and stuff. So, And what were you thinking about doing when you were growing up? Being in a band, really, no way. from a very early age, was what I wanted to do. Why was that? I don't know. I was exposed to uh, good music at a very early age, like via my parents, and just growing up listening to music, all you know, listening and wanting to play music, and I played like all sorts of instruments when I was really young. So it's just right from the beginning, definitely. What kind of stuff were they playing? Uh, a lot of old, um, a lot of old folk music, a lot of um, heaps and heaps of Irish music. Um, sort of grew up on Christy Moore and uh, the Pogues and things like that. So yeah, from a, a lot of Bob Dylan, um, and then also things like the Beatles and the Stones and a lot of sort of sixties, seventies rock and roll kind of thing. And what about yourself? The stuff where you kind of getting into? <laughs> it's a dangerous question. Um, I don't know. Mostly that kind of thing, and just digging out records from my parents' sort of record collection, and finding stuff that not wasn't necessarily what teenagers were supposed to listen to, kind of thing, and looking through old Motown records and just interesting things rather than the, the sort of the pop. Was there nothing in the charts or, or nothing? No, was nothing. Play? Some of it, sort of. Look, it was from a really when when I was really really young. Then it would be you know chart music, would, you know, sort of happy dancey, what have you. But then, sort of growing up, it was more sort of a challenge to find interesting music, and not necessarily just the sort of vacuous pop stuff. Yeah. And before you went to university, did you manage to get to play with anyone locally or? Um, I played briefly with uh, a friend's band in college, but nothing at all, seriously at all. So I think we all sort of went to London to try and find the right people to yeah. to be in a band with. So. But what did you actually go to London to study? Uh, anthropology. Why? Why? Because, uh, I don't know, it just made sense. Like, from the things I did, I'd been studying beforehand, history and stuff like history and sociology and psychology just sort of encapsulated all of them and so and when you were going there now was it with a you know in, in your mind I want to be an anthropologist or was it I'll do a bit of anthropology and see if I can get the music going um a bit of both but when it sort of when I got there it was like there was, was such a thriving musical environment it was like this has got to be the place to do it if you don't do it now then you'll never do it kind of thing so and how quickly did you meet up with the others? Uh, I met Johnny on the first day, the first evening in our hall bar at the pool table. And then uh, Chris about three days after that, and then Guy about a week after that. And it was just from bumping into people, yeah. there was no advertising? No, 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 it was just, yeah, just mates who had guitars. And how quickly did you start playing together? Uh, within about sort of a few months, Chris and Johnny were writing together with guitars and then Guy joined at the end of, or at the beginning of the summer and then I joined at the beginning of the next year, so it all happened reasonably quickly. Very good. When, when exactly was that? That was, well I, as we, we fully formed in January 98. And when did you start playing gigs as Coldplay? Uh, two weeks after I joined. Very nice. <laughs> <coughs> what was that like initially? Uh, what sort of gigging? Yeah. Um, gigging at the beginning was great because it basically was just all of our friends, and we'd we'd get sort of done over by a dodgy promoter who would sort of 
basically rip us off, but we'd have all our mates there, so it wouldn't make a difference because we were all enjoying ourselves. It was just like, it became like a, an occasion where all our friends would just come and have a good night out, so we could, like, all our disparate groups of friends all get together and have a good day, a good evening. And was it original stuff from the word go? Yeah. No covers at all? No. Just straight out. So when you're rehearsing together, what kind of stuff were you all agreeing on that you liked? Music, what, in terms of bands? Yeah. Or, I don't know, not... It never really entered into the conversation, to be honest, who, who liked what band. It was just a, a case of, this is what I like to play, and this is what you like to play, and it works well together. It wasn't really... We didn't really sit down and think, well, you like them and I like him, so we're going to have to try and do that. It, was, it wasn't sort of formulated in any way, it was just play what you play and it all just fitted together fit really nicely. And when did you start to think that this is actually quite good? Or was that straight away? Pretty much. From the, we could just see it getting better and better at each stage, like when someone else joined it would, be, it would get better and then when it was fully formed, on the well, 6th of January, I think it was. It was just like, there, yeah, it's, it's done. We know that it's a lot better than some of the stuff we've heard. So. Yeah. And how long then, if I get this right, the first EP was the safety EP. Mm -hmm. How long was it before you recorded that? I, I, I sat down in 98. I've got a feeling it was about March, I think. Pretty much, and I say that came out. And why did you do that? Why? Yeah. Because um, we've been trying to record demos on uh, four track, and they were just not didn't sound any good at all. Because we wanted to get the music out to people, like radios and uh, record companies, what have you. And so we, um, our manager, well, who became our Phil, who became our manager put up the money for us to go and record something in a studio, a proper studio with digital recording and um, something that was a bit more tangible for it, rather than just sending a grubby cassette, you know, an actual CD with artwork and everything. So it was just a way of having something physical to give to people rather than just, you can't, it's, it's great to rely on word of mouth and that's what we've been doing, that's, you know, we're quite happy with the way that word is spread about the band, but you need something physical for people to latch on to. So when you did that, released the first kind of EP, did it, how much of an effect did it have on how things were going? Um, not much at the time, because we basically we had, we ordered 500 copies of the safety EP, and um, for about a few months we had all 500 copies in our bedrooms kind of thing. So that was pretty, uh, but we basically we sent out loads and loads and loads to to record companies, radio stations, and sold them to our mates at gigs and what have you. Um, but then we, we sent this sent one copy off to a thing called In the City, which um, I believe was in Dublin mm. at one. Was it last year or the year before? Oh, yeah. And um, so yes, yeah, so we sent that off. Well, Phil had sent that off without us really knowing, just as a shot in the dark, and then. They came back and they said, you know, we'd like it, we'd like you to play in this thing in Manchester. And so we went up there, we sort of had a big intensive rehearsal, like uh, down in Chris's house in Devon. And um, so, yeah, we were ready for that and we went up, played in this tiny little place called the Cuba Cafe in Manchester, in the back street of Manchester. There's about 15 people there, but one person sort of came away thinking, might be quite good, and she phoned us the next day. We got back to London and then it all sort of spiralled from Who is she? Uh, she's called uh, Deborah Wilde, Debs, who was at the time at Universal. She was like the sort of first one to latch onto it. Yeah. And did she get you into demos or? Uh, no, not really. She introduced us to a lawyer who she knew quite well, uh, which was great because then we got sent her an offer for a deal. From, I think it was an American guy who'd been at, um, in the city and heard about us. And it was in November of 98. And it was the most, it was, it was an appalling, appallingly bad, ill-constructed contract. And it would have been lethal for us to sign it, kind of thing. So he sorted, he sorted that out. And then 
as we were playing more and more slightly high profile, well higher profile gigs mm -hmm. in London, more people came to see us and that's when uh, um, Dan Keeling from Parlophone came up and sort of introduced himself. Yeah. And what happened with First Panda? Uh, yeah. Um, well, again that was from doing uh, gigs around London and Simon Williams, who's the guy who who was a, a journalist and sort of also runs this Fierce Panda label. He um, sort of first mentioned me and I had in a magazine, which was great, it was a, sort of uh, bands to watch for 99 kind of thing. And we were there and he'd written this really nice piece about us. And then later on he'd said, um, well, do you want to record a single for us? And we were like, well, definitely. And then for, on the, off the back of that, that started getting uh, radio player on Steve Lamack and things like that. And so, sort of, yeah, again, it started spiralling from yeah. there. So that in conjunction with the girl from Universal mm. basically brought the, yeah. the Parliament deal. How much of the album would you have had written at that stage? At what stage when we were signed? Yeah. yeah. Very That's little. Very little. Well, in terms of how it now sounds, the album, then very little, yeah. And uh, much is made that there was a bidding war for you. Was there a bidding war? Um, as far as we know, yeah, and probably there was. I don't know. It's weird. All we know is that there were quite a few people who were wanting to sign us, basically. So we had people, you know, flashing their money around, saying, oh, we'll take you here, we'll take you here. And at the end of the day, we signed to the people, not the people that were sort of being flashy. It was just the people who we thought understood us and our music and our direction most, which was part of it. Sort of their history of uh, treating bands really, really well and um, letting bands uh, develop naturally and not pushing them too far it was sort of that's all was, was what we needed. We needed yeah. to hear that. And, and the minute you signed, you all went back to finish your final. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that seems like a very clear headed, level headed way. Well, that's the thing. I think one lesson we've been taught taught from all of just sitting back and watching the music industry go by is that it's, it's so easy for bands to be the flavour of the month and then suddenly you know you're down the pan and no one's interested kind of thing and I think it's probably on the advice of our parents more than anything just say get it done and finish it and then at least you have something to fall back on if it all goes, uh, all goes pear shaped. And how did you all get on your files? Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's amazing you managed to with Blind the colours. with the uh, with the gigs and, and recording to balance the two must yeah. be very difficult. Remember, we did have a lot of spare time though, being at university, <laughs> a lot of time to uh, rehearse. So when you finish the finals, it's time to record, you know, your debut album. Um, were Parlophone giving you, you know, advice or trying to take you in a particular direction? No. Um, well, what happened was we went in to record an EP, we thought the idea would be a, a good idea to be an EP rather than a, a single straight away kind of thing. And so we went into a, a, a studio in London with a producer who was very much a producer, producer kind of go in there and play that, do this, do that kind of thing. And we were in there for six weeks and I think it's only, we sort of we recorded about eight tracks and there's maybe two of them that we're remotely happy with to that we, we let people listen to but I think that was quite a, it was a massively important um, period for us because it made us realise how we didn't want to record an album, how we didn't want to sound and how we've got to take a, a stronger uh, we've got to be a stronger voice in our direction rather than letting someone sort of dictate what you're going to do so yeah we came out of that session extremely uh, down, everyone was really, really miserable and not happy with what we'd produced and everything. So, but part of them were great, and we could have released uh, an album along those lines, um, but they said they weren't particularly happy with it either, which was great because we were in this period whereby we didn't know what we were supposed to do, what was right, what was wrong, and um, they said it's not that good. So, go and try something else with a different producer. And we did, and we've got introduced to Ken Nelson, and then sort of happened from there. Yeah, well, why Ken? 
Um, not just, a big name. Well, not a big name, but his, the records that he's been on is a sort of records that we think are a, a perfect in terms of production, like the Gomez records and uh, Bad to Drawn Boy. And we'd heard stuff that he'd done on the Bad to Drawn Boy EPs. And it, it's not always about who who uh, is the biggest name and who's the who's got the most sort of credits to his name. It's more about for us it was certainly more about having someone who was just easy to get on with and someone who knew technically knew all their stuff, a, you know, a really good engineer, which Ken is. But because we wanted to co produce, um, you need someone who has the strength of mind to tell you if you think something's wrong, but then will also listen to you where you sit you know, point at you and say, get in there and do that kind of thing. It's just like having a fifth member of the band and just very, very easy to work with. And did you have the songs ready going in at that stage? Or? Some of them. So you actually write in the studio a bit, didn't you? Yeah. Um, what was written in the studio about? Quite a few. Uh, Yellow was written in the studio, bizarrely enough. We were just finishing recording, uh, we just recorded Shiver. It's in the same guitar tuning. Yeah. And um, we were down in Rockfield in South Wales. We went out and had a, um, because we'd been in the city for years, we hadn't sort of seen a good, decent country sky. We went out and it was just pitch black with just incredible, incredible skyline. And, and Chris started singing like Neil Young. It's like an old, uh, really, really slow and whiny Neil Young song. And then out of that came, came Yellow. So you'd no idea at the time that it was going to be mm -hmm. a breakthrough. Well, it, as soon as I heard it, well, as soon as I heard it in its more modern form, and we when Johnny put his guitar riff over the top, it was like, oh, that's all right. <laughs> it could be good. When you had it finished, um, did you? What kind of ambition was there in the band for the album? What you hoped it would achieve? Or? We hoped that it would sell well, well not sell, well do well, but I think we all anticipated a much longer slog to get anywhere near where we are now kind of thing. We were fully prepared to sell however many copies and keep doing the, uh, the rounds yeah. as it were. You did do the rounds, you kind of launched yourself into that whole you know, touring world. I know the first tour uh, with Shaq and everything digital. How, how did you enjoy that? What was that experience like? It was brilliant actually. For us it was a brilliant, brilliant tour because uh, it was four bands completely different and all sort of different levels of uh, support and um, completely different bands as well. So of course, you, you know, we went out and some of the times we got you know, we were hated by everyone kind of thing, but then a lot of the times it was a lot more positive. And it was the first time we got to play on sort of bigger stages, which was really useful, really sort of good experience. What did you make of Shaq? Because I would imagine them coming from you know, a normal background and being, you know, reasonably clean living, coming up against Shaq, you must have felt, my God. Um, the, the boys from Shaq were incredible, though, because they, obviously they've had their you know, they've had their quite a fierce life, but they're still there, the qualities that, that make them good musicians are still there, they're just deeply nice people, really, really nice and really caring and, uh, and brilliant, they, the bond between the two brothers, Mick and um, John is so close and they under, understand each other musically really, really well and they're, they've got an absolute passion for music, so it doesn't I think that's all. In our eyes, that's all that matters, really. Yeah. And we also we always get we always get grief for not being rock and roll and not having worked down mines and not met in Boston or whatever. And uh, I do, I find it a problem. Actually, I do have to get quite annoyed when I've, you have to justify why you're in a position. It's like, well, if you like my music, if you yeah. like our music, then you don't. What does it matter where you come from? I think is facet of tabloid sort of journalism. It's always a story and the substance isn't enough, you've got to have something else to try and dig up on someone. So But I would imagine that you'd you'd look at Shaq and you would also think that, you know, music seems to carry an awful lot of dangers with it that, you know, no matter what background you have, when you're in music it is a very 
you know, you're touring a lot, you're away from home, you're in that kind of environment. An awful lot of talents are destroyed by it. Mm. Would Shaq make you even more determined not to be destroyed? No, because I think throughout whatever they've done, they've always kept in sight the fact that they they're extremely passionate about music and uh, I sort of our resolve is probably is strong enough to say no to whatever because I think that you know you do hear stories about people getting mad and doing this and that, but I only think the day I think the only danger is is losing the passion and there are some things that do sort of suck passion out of you. I don't know, like so there's some weird drugs that seem to do that to people. And so that's the only danger. I mean, I don't object to it whatsoever, you know, live how you want to live, but if it, sort of, if it gets in the way of your sort of passion about music, then that's when it becomes a danger. And um, you then had the terrace and Muse, how were they, were they getting bigger and bigger? Or, you know, crowd wise? Uh, yeah, the terrace one was really good actually. It was a, quite a slog. I think it's about 20, 22 gigs all around, but uh, brilliant though, and we sort of, it's, it's not like we're sort of hard and tall pros kind of thing, but you start to notice um, areas where the re react crowd reaction is a lot stronger, and for some reason sort of, always in Glasgow, it's always brilliant, and this, but this is, this, this sort of trip is the first we've come over to Ireland as a band, so we're just experiencing that now, which is something quite incredible. And uh, but yeah, and, and some areas that are really dull as well. I can't. They just so don't seem to sort of you know, get a reaction out of people. Yeah, it's really weird. But in terms of the the, the tours, then that, that terrace gig was was great. Cause it was like a co-headline thing. And then uh, the Muse one after that. Again, was great because it was bigger venues, and we also had kind of a crossover with the fans. I think a lot of news fans had heard of us and knew a couple of songs, which was really, really great because it meant that we didn't feel completely like the alienated support band. Mm -hmm. And we got on really well with all the bands personally as well, so it made it very easy. And then finally, after that, was the first um, solo tour. Was that the highlight of it so far? Or? What, this tour? No, you, just after you did those three tours, you did your first, just around the time of the enemy. And oh yeah, we did, so... Yeah. <laughs> Bring you back. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was with Mercedes, yeah, that's right. Um, no, that was good. Again, it was sort of the smaller venues, but I think we ended up in London, our last gig was in London at the Scala, which was uh, about 800 people, which was sold out, and that was a real kind of buzz to know that we were selling out gigs, so... It was pretty special. Yeah. It seemed to be just around there as well that it just seemed to click with everybody. I remember I was playing Yellow on the radio and suddenly it seemed like everybody was just talking about Coldplay and the next minute it was crashing into the charts. Did, when did you get a sense of it suddenly? I don't know, it's all since, I think it was since Yellow was sort of given to radio, it just started getting picked up and by everyone putting on playlists and it was it was mad. We were completely like, well, what's going on? Kind of thing, you know. Yesterday, before we gave Yellow to Radio, no one really cared. And then, you know, you give someone a CD, and then it's like everything starts to sort of pick up. And it was it was kind of weird. And we were quite worried about overexposure because everyone was just flogging it to death. Do you know what I mean? Everyone was really playing it and playing it and playing it. And we got something like 600 plays a week on XFM or something. And it's like, well. How long can people actually still want to listen to it? And I think we were quite worried about the whole notion of something being played on radio for six weeks before it's available to be bought, and I think people would be bored of it by the time it gets to the shop. So, but it was weird. But it was about that time when things started going a bit weird. What was the weirdest about it? Um, being exactly the same people playing exactly the same music, but everyone else's reaction to you changing slightly. Slightly unnerving because yeah. you don't know what you've done. We're still exactly the same. We're still the, s the songs are all the same. Um, but yet yeah, something's different. Something's changed. Did it put pressure on you, or um, was it just fun? It was. It was fun. I think the pressure that we 
feel on ourselves. Sorry, the pressure that we feel the most is the pressure that we put on ourselves because we don't want to be a band that um, sort of dies out kind of thing. We want to, we want to improve and I don't think we're, we're, we're not going to release anything else until it, we know that it's better than the previous thing. So. But, you know, externally, it's is the band the kind of band that can, you know, stays together or whatever to ward off the evil attentions of the media? Hopefully. Yeah. I think it's nothing we've been learning over the last few months. That's what's been the, actually that's the weirdest thing that's happened over the last six months or, when was it, June? Yeah, about five months. It's that um, suddenly everyone wants to interview you and they all want to ask you the same four questions and you have to answer them, you know, 18 times a day and it becomes a lot more difficult to uh, remain sincere and motivated and yeah. to answer these questions when it, it is the same thing over and over again. I remember one day we were sat down to do um, regional press phone interviews. I sat on my lounge at home and I think it was 14 in a row from about 10 in the morning to about 4 in the afternoon. Just solid, and then you had to do international ones where you're speaking to people from Thailand, where the phone lines are appalling, and you you answer a question really fluently and eloquent, and uh, and they can't hear you, so you've got to say it again and again. And it, just, it just becomes it was quite painful, frustrating, extremely. <laughs> I'm very far from the music as well. Yeah. Yeah, but what's you mean? You have to take pleasure then where you can kind of find it, which is in the music. What's what's the best bit for you this stage? Is it gigs, writing songs, recording? Um, at the moment, it's anything vaguely creative because we've been in this because circumstances arose over the last month whereby we didn't get to play. Basically, Johnny was quite ill, and for for other reasons, it was just a promotional slog. And it was. Um, that was a sort of a very weird time over the last month. It's been probably the weirdest time we've had. Um, but I think and we're sort of getting to realise that we need to do what we actually are supposed to do as musicians, or else we we just we we've split up in the next week probably if we didn't get to play, because. That's the only thing that drives us, the only thing that makes us do these interviews is knowing that if it's going to give us a more chance to, to play music to people and to write music, then you know, you've got to do it. So. But they all, we sort of, we get different things out of playing live is incredible because you know, you get the sort of feedback from the audience and when you see, like for example, last night we were in Belfast, it was incredible just during yellow, the lights were turned on the audience, and that's the first time I could see them because it's usually all the lights beaming in your face, kind of thing. And it was just staggering. Everyone was jumping up and down, everyone arms in the air, and that was an amazing feeling. So you get that kind of real rush of playing live, but then you get excitement from writing stuff because you know you're always trying to think of new parts and getting excited because you you can see the the. Uh, the promise in each of the, each of these new ideas, and and then actual recording is kind of relief almost. I remember during the recording session of the album, it was a lot of times it was a real relief to to nail the song because you you've got this idea in your head, and all four of us have probably got very different ideas of what the song should sound like in our head. But you know, you talk about it and you agree on a, a structure and what have you, and then it just takes for trouble, for example, to weeks to record, it really did, because it worked at about 15 different tempos and with different sort of feel and stuff and when we actually nailed it, it was like, oh, thank the Lord, kind of thing, it was real relief. So you get different things out of different, uh, the different sort of sides of the creative thing. Yeah. Are you thinking ahead already to the next album? Yeah. Do you have any ideas in mind, producer or something like that? Not really. Um, we just got an I ideas about the fact that it sh again it should be the songs that dictate the levels of production. I think what we're really happy about in the first that on, on parachutes is that um, the songs are the important thing, and it's not there's no token productionism. There's no like 
putting a bleep in there for the sake of it. It's all the production makes the songs kind of stand out. And in that respect, it's quite sort of traditional. It's not that cutting edge or anything. It's just about the songs. So, I mean, there's every chance that the next one could be a bit more technologically advanced or whatever. Yeah. But I don't think I'd, we'd never do that just for the sake of doing it. It'd have to be because it made the songs better. And what do you think of the music scene generally that you're a part of now? Is it an inspiring one? Is there a lot of creativity in it? Or? What, which scene? Well, just the music world. I mean, I saw the, the, the Mercury Music Awards and I was thinking there, there are a lot of great bands around. Um, do you think there's enough great bands around? or mm. Is it an inspiring think, time to be in a band? I think it is. It is a good time to be in a band because there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of people in bands around that are seem to be returning to, it's like a resurgence in returning to uh, the things that are important, especially to us as a band, about performance and uh, passion and song, good songwriting. And I think there's a, while, a lot of sort of, over the last few years, there's been a lot of um, sort of image-based things and the charts have been ruled by image and image rather than substance. So it's just nice to see people coming back to not really caring about what they look like or how they come across in interviews, though it's the, the power of the music is, is doing the job for them. So in that respect, it's really exciting. And do you think about where you stand in terms of the other bands? I know you get those comparisons with you know, everybody who's in the charts, basically. Do you think in terms of what they're doing, is it good or does that inform what you do? or? You just see yourself separate from it. Um, you can't help but be influenced by things around you, and not just music. It's your influences come from all aspects of life, and music is a big part of that. So, but yeah, you, we always get compared to this and that, and to them, and you know all the bands that we get compared to. But I think it would be it'd be pointless to say that. You know, they, 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 none of them have influenced us because it's not even conscious, that kind of thing. It's a, real, it's a subconscious thing. You're just taking everything around you and whether, whether you be sort of positively influenced by it or negatively influenced by it. So, yeah, I'd be lying if I said that we didn't listen and enjoy to, um, a lot of music around the moment. But likewise, there's, for all the bands that we get compared to, they're, they're, they always seem to be in the last sort of five years, whereas there were probably more apt ones that go back maybe 20, 30 years kind of thing, so. Probably even to the bands that are around the moment as well. Exactly. We'll just change tape there, Tom. Oh, okay. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, that's it's work. Oh, wait. Right. Another couple of minutes there. Cool. Right here, turn the tape. You right there? Yeah. <laughs> it's a strong wrist. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> wait on that. It's always a new job. Yeah. That was absolutely going to be That was absolutely going to be a little bit. Um, sorry. Are you sorry. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Where did you play last one? Uh, Belfast. The Hall. Yeah. Sure. Short sure. beats. Sure. 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 Limited. Brilliant, mate. Yeah, they're yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant, mate. Done? No, I'm sorry. Was it full? Yeah. yeah. The whole tour sold out. Yeah, Great. Yeah. 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 Have thrown away Cullaway, it's just Stephen's hand and makes my sort of stuff. Okay, are you ready for it? Really? Should we start in the wild again? Yes, please. 20 over? Yeah, I Okay, and we'll co-play two.
I said three more questions. Not really. um, I'm just wondering about your view of the music business. Do you think it helps talent or destroys it? Um, I'm not sure. I think without the music industry, I think in a perfect world, people would have access to music without any form of media or anything, any form of business. Um, but it was like a, a kind of, but music was more of like an oral tradition kind of thing where you got passed down things and, you know, in an ideal world that'd be great, but from a musician's point of view, it's quite nice to sort of see the rewards of, of playing music and writing music. So it's a difficult one, after you, but it, oh, the, the trappings of the industry can destroy people, definitely. Um, but without it, new bands in fact, will find it difficult to to get themselves out there. So yeah, and with someone like, like Chris, like he doesn't you know um, drink or smoke or anything, does, does that help? Or does that make it more of a problem? I mean, does that keep you separate from it? Or? Um, I don't think it's in any way, shape, or form an issue. He just doesn't because he never has and it's not a conscious decision. He hasn't doesn't want to try and separate himself from whatever. It's just and the only way you can remain separate in an industry like this is to be yourself and be honest with yourself and not conform to the either the industry or the sort of you know the the way of life that the industry sort of uh, pursues. So I think all of us are just trying to be ourselves, and that's the sort of way that we try and separate ourselves from everybody else. So far, you find that easy to do? Or to Reasonably. Yeah, I think so. I hope so, anyway. That's just the yarn. And um, what would you hope, where would you hope to see the band in about five years' time? It's, that's, if you'd asked me that about, if you'd asked me where we thought we'd have been in five years, uh, about six months ago, you probably got a very different answer than the one you're going to get now. <laughs> I don't know, it's weird, it's something that we've been thinking about quite a lot recently because um, if the record company had its way, I imagine we, we would be promoting this album, Parachutes, for quite some time yet. Um, but we, we really don't want to do that. We don't want people to be sick of it. We want to always progress and not sort of hold back and cling on to sort of old stuff so we're just at the moment we're sort of concentrating on trying to get good better songs for this next album and that's that's as far as we're thinking we're not thinking any further in terms of, you know nothing that could well be it do you know what I mean because it's it's just really difficult there's a lot of pressure to to produce a really cracking second album and a lot of bands that produce a brilliant first album sort of succumb to that pressure and the second one's not so good. So I think and that's if we carried on if we carry on flogging parachutes until everyone's sick of it then that's what will happen I think and we'll not have time to do a good second album. So at the moment I think we're only thinking we're not even thinking as far as the album, we're thinking where am I going to be tomorrow? So it's kind of difficult. It's, it's ever since it's sort of taken off, I find I can't think in days or years anymore. It's all in hours. You know, I've got to speak to so and so at two o'clock, and then I've got a 15 minute break where I can you know, get something to eat and have a quick snooze. So my time has become a lot more sort of segmented. Very good. Well, that's all I can Thanks, well. Right. Thank you. Stay around. Lovely. Um, Love a recap, <coughs> it's okay, we're just in the whole beginning of Coldplay. If you just take us through that again, maybe more succinctly, you know, in the sense that well, Coldplay began. Right. And just take us through that one more time, and just you're saving me a lot of, lot of grief in the other suite. Okay. Is that okay? And, do you want to in there? Yeah. In terms of, just talk to Tom. Okay. Yeah, please, stay in there. The word to I think it means roughly how Coldplay came together. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, Coldplay started um, when we all moved to uh, London, UCL University in London, um, before we'd come from all sort of four corners of the British Isles, and we got to yeah we got together. We all were in the same halls of residence in the first year. We got together just through meeting people and through friends and um, eventually sort of figured out that we were all musicians and sort of grew from there.